living for God in Babylon. Babylon means confusion. And the name comes from the Tower of Babel. Are you guys familiar with the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11? Where Nimrod, who was the first mighty king and antichrist-like figure after the world flood, as you know, he tried to erect or build a tower that would supposedly reach to the heavens, right? And it was an act of defiance towards Yahweh. Why? Because the only one that should be worshipped is him, but they came together as one to worship false gods and to defy God's command to populate the earth. So God told them what to do and they said, no, we'll do our own thing. So that's where we get the word Babylon from. It means confusion and it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. And at that time, the triune God came down to confuse their languages, to stop their idolatrous project and disperse the people throughout the world. Babylon was also a literal kingdom located in modern day Iraq, that is in the Middle East. Babylon and its mighty king Nebuchadnezzar existed about 600 years before Jesus was born. So that's the brief history and origin of the name Babylon and the location of Babylon. So when I say living for God in Babylon, I'm saying living for God in a land of confusion. Are we not living in a culture of absolute confusion? We don't even know what a woman is. We got to debate that. It's to say living for God in a foreign land, living for God in a perverse land, living for God in a land of godless government, in a land full of idols, in a land full of idolatry. We can simply say living for God in America or living for God in this fallen world. My encouragement today is that you would live for God, that you would live in a God honoring way in a fallen culture, in a fallen society, in a fallen world, in a fallen nation, right? That's the loving exhortation that I bring before you this morning. Today I'm going to focus on four young men who lived in the literal ancient Babylon and how they lived for God there. How they denied their fleshly desires for God. And how they stood for God no matter the cost. These four men are, as you guys know, Daniel, who was the prophet Daniel, the author of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Then you had Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You may remember them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But that is not their real names. And we'll look at that in a moment. Before we read out of the book of Daniel, let me give you some background. On March 16th, 597 BC, that means before Christ, the kingdom of Babylon surrounded and overtook Jerusalem and brought back thousands of captives with them. Daniel and his three buddies, we'll call them his tres amigos, were in the mix of those Jewish captives. So that's the background. Babylon comes and conquers Jerusalem and brings in Daniel and his three buddies, and they serve in the kingdom of Babylon. But why was Jerusalem conquered and destroyed? We need to read Jeremiah 25. So turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 25. We're going to read verses 4 to 12. I want you guys to see why it is that God allowed this to happen. This is Jeremiah uh, talking to and warning the nation of Israel, starting there in verse 4. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, but you have not listened nor inclined your ear to them. They said, repent, that is to turn from your sin, repent. Now everyone who is, everyone of his evil way and his evil doings and dwell in the land that the Lord has given you and your fathers forever and ever. That was just God's way of telling the people in Israel, look, 
if you turn away from your evil, you can live in Jerusalem peacefully in my sight. Verse six, do not go after other gods to serve them and worship them and do not provoke me to anger with the works of your hands. And they were doing so many evil things with their hands. One of those things was they created many, many false idols and worshiped them instead of the one true God, right? He says, I will not harm you. In other words, if you're not idolatrous, I will not turn you over to the king of Babylon. Verse seven, yet you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Verse eight, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, he calls him my servant because he's going to do God's will, and that is to punish Israel, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing and perpetual desolation. Moreover, I will take from them the voice of myrrh and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, saith the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. So you have it there. Why was God allowing Babylon to overtake Jerusalem? It was because they would not repent of their sin. And right there in verse 10, the Lord basically said there's going to be no more celebration in Jerusalem. There's going to be no more wedding vows. There's going to be no more music, no more songs. There's going to be no more work because, you know, some people take pleasure in work. And he says, I'm going to strip it all away. And I'm going to allow my servant, Nebuchadnezzar, to come in and bring you in as captives. And you're going to serve him for 70 years. And then he says, after that, I'm going to give King Nebuchadnezzar a spanking and the other nations which mistreated Israel. All right. So this is what's going on. This is how. It all started. Now, turn the revelation of God to Daniel chapter 1. This is where we get to the main part. Daniel chapter 1, we're going to read verses 1 to 9. Here we're going to find out how we should live in Babylon through their example. Starting there in verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Do you notice here that it was all the Lord's work? You know, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you keep reading, he takes pride in thinking that he's the one conquering all the nations. He sees himself as the king of kings. And in one sense, he was speaking in earthly terms. But we see here that it was God who gave Jehoiakim and Judah to his hand. And it says, with some of the articles of the house of God. So these were holy tools and, and things that were used in the worship of the temple there in Jerusalem. And in Daniel chapter 5, King Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, uses these holy things to throw a drunken party and get slammed while worshiping his false gods. And so they totally blaspheme the God of Israel and they blaspheme the holy things of Yahweh. All right. And it says there, continue reading in verse two, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. Stop there for a moment. The Babylonian's chief deity or God was Marduk. He was also known as Baal, meaning Lord. And we find that in Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse 2. And so at this time, they had built a temple to Marduk. And that's the God that they're 
talking about in this verse here. Continue reading, it says, And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. That is the same false God. Verse 3. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. By the way, these eunuchs were castrated men who served the king's women because he didn't want, you know, anybody hooking up with his women. So they took things off. All right. Uh, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Verse 4. Young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. In other words, he went for the best looking and the most brightest of the bunch who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Verse 5, And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now listen to this in verse 7. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Baal-Tejazar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. And I love this portion here. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. There's a lot there. If you continue to read, what you will find is Daniel asked the chief of the eunuchs, look, we don't eat this food, we don't drink this stuff. Will you please allow us to eat healthy food, vegetables, and just drink water? And I will show you that, you know, you can check after some time and you will see that we are healthier than your guys. And so the Lord blesses that. And then they're allowed to stay away from the king's foods. God blesses that. And if you continue to read, you will also find that these four men became 10 times wiser than all of Nebuchadnezzar's top men. So God's hand was on these four men in a very powerful and miraculous way. But here we see the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he wanted to Babylonize the four Hebrew men. That was the goal. That's what you're reading. He wanted to Babylonize them. Going back to verse 4 and B, which is the second half of verse 4, it says, whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. That's just another word for the Babylonians. And verse 5b says, And three years of training for them, so that they might serve before the king. You might think, well, they're treating them really good, and in one sense they are. But you have to understand that this is not necessarily a good thing. They were taken captive. They were taken from their homeland, from their families. And now they are forced to learn the language and the ways of their enemies. This wasn't just some top-notch free education. This was total indoctrination. This was total brainwashing. They brought them in to brainwash them. To, in one sense, remake them. They wanted to, in one sense, strip the ways of the laws of Yahweh out of them. And so that's the reason why they poured their literature into them to, in one sense, flood out the truth that was already inside of them. To strip the Old Testament out of their hearts and remove God's word from their daily conversation. That was the point of it all. And isn't that what much of America's sinful entertainment and so-called education does today. Isn't it all created and designed to destroy the worship, the knowledge, the fear, and the obedience of the one true God? 
I mean, isn't in one sense America just like Babylon? And in some sense, we're even worse because we have a lot of light, more light than any other nation has ever had. We have more Bibles, more Christian broadcastings, more Christian podcasts, more Christian literature, more Christian songs than any other nation in the world. So because of that, we are worse off than even Babylon, than even Sodom and Gomorrah, any other nation in world history. Much of what we call harmless entertainment and helpful education is really indoctrination. That's what it is. We, we call it harmless entertainment. We call it helpful education. But in reality, it is a kind of indoctrination. From the school system to social media, to cartoons, to movies, to video games, to music, to podcasts, to books. Again, all that we call harmless entertainment, all that we call helpful education is really indoctrination. Going back to the school system, there are two schools near my house. One's a little further than the other. But one of them is Johnson Elementary School, which is just maybe two miles away from my house. And when you walk into that school, you'll notice that their steps are painted like the colors of the rainbow to remind everybody who comes into the school that they have to be homosexual affirming, right? That's the point of that, to remind everybody that this location here, this is what we are for. And then also, Choya High School, that's the school that I graduated from just a few years ago. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> as soon as you park there or you drop off your kid, the entrance of the school, you'll find a giant trans flag. And so before you walk into the school, you got to walk over this flag and you have to remember that that's what this school is about, right? And so that's what I mean about the indoctrination in our school system. And not just that, you already know evolution, the Big Bang Theory, all of those things to discredit the one true God, the creator and maker of all things, right? And on and on and on it goes. Everything teaches us something. You have to understand that you're always being taught something. Whatever it is you watch, whether it's a movie, a cartoon, you're playing a video game, or you're reading somebody's post, you're learning something. Everything teaches. Everything does. And everything moves us in a certain direction. And most of what's out there is designed to move us, as you guys know, away from God. It doesn't draw us closer to God. Just pay close attention to the things you watch. Pay close attention to the things that you hear and the things that you read. And then ask yourself, do these things prompt me to seek God? Is what I'm watching, is what I'm hearing, is what I'm reading producing a deep desire for God? Most of the time, no. Right? Unless you really are somebody who is disciplined in your ways and you are extremely picky about what you see, what you watch, or what you read, then I would say, then yes. If your focus is to truly honor God and draw closer to God, then you're going to spend more time on the things that will help you in that way. Can I get an amen? And this training was for three years. For three years. The interesting thing about that is it takes about that amount of time to get a college degree. And if you pay close attention to Jesus and his disciples, he taught them for about three years, maybe three and a half years. And so that's exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar had in mind. He wanted to make them, in one sense, his disciples. His disciples. Listen, you are the disciples of the ones who teach you most. You are the disciples of either the world or you are truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. If we're going to say that we're disciples of Jesus Christ, then we must be reading everything he has taught us in Scripture and we must be given to the obedience of those things. That's what a disciple is. Amen. Verse 5 says that these four young men had access to the king's finest foods and the king's finest drinks. And so they had keys to the refrigerator and keys to the cellar. They could pretty much eat whatever they want and drink whatever they want. And it was all the finest foods in the world because Babylon was the richest and most powerful nation at the time. Just go back to verse eight again. Daniel chapter one and verse eight. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, 
nor with the wine which he drank. Right. That tells you right there that Daniel and I do believe that Daniel is speaking for the other three because they were all together in this rejection of the king's foods and drinks. This is how we live in Babylon. We commit ourselves to not defiling ourselves with the world's junk. I tell my kids all the time, you have to make a firm decision not to eat the devil's food, not to drink the devil's drinks, right? You have to make a firm decision. You have to be solid about that. I can't make that decision for you. Your pastor can't make that decision for you. God doesn't even make that decision for us. He puts that on our laps. And if we're truly going to be dedicated to Christ, dedicated to his glory, dedicated to his honor, then we're going to say, you know what? I am not of this world. Amen. Yeah, I live in this world, but I'm not of this world. I know that after this, I'm going to glory, mm. right? And the only things I shoot down are anything that can destroy us. Anything that belittles the honor, the glory, and the character of God. Of course, there are a lot of good things that we can enjoy. All I'm saying is be very picky about the things you enjoy. Daniel and his tres amigos rejected the king's food because they ate the kind of foods and meats that God commanded the Jews to eat in the Old Testament. They were going to be faithful to the dietary laws. That's the reason why they said no, because I'm sure they probably had a big fat pig with an apple in his mouth sitting on the center of a very fancy table. And they thought to themselves, we're not eating that. Or whatever else you have in your refrigerator or on the grill or in the stove. They honored the Old Testament dietary laws. That is, they honored God's word above their own appetite. And they rejected the king's drinks because... There were obviously strong drinks. They rejected the liquors. They rejected the tequilas. They rejected the dos equis. And I don't know the name of too many others, but they rejected that poison. They rejected it. They refused drunkenness is what that was. And Daniel chapter 5 shows us that their drinking was connected to the worship of false gods. So they already knew that if they start giving into this dirty food... Enticing food, dirty because God called it that, enticing because I'm sure it was very, very delicious. The way it looked, the way it tasted, the way it smelled, the absolute best, right? And so they knew that, and so they stayed away from the food because it would change their mood, it would change their minds, it would change their hearts, it would cause them to be comfortable in Babylon. They said, no! And then they also knew that if they start drinking this stuff, they're going to get drunk, And they're going to dishonor God. They're going to dishonor their bodies. And then again, like I said, in Daniel chapter 5, drunkenness was connected to the worship of false gods. For those of you who have been drunk and those of you who still get drunk, it alters your mind. It alters your mind. It changes you from the inside out. It changes the way you speak, the way you act, the way you think. And that's the reason why the Bible says, do not be filled with wine. Do not be controlled with liquor and beer, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be controlled by the Spirit of God. And how does he do that? Through the Word of God, through the truth. He is the author of the Bible. So reject the world's evils of all kinds and remember that you belong to the Lord. That is something that they knew very well about themselves. They understood that they were God's property. That's so important. You have to be totally and completely convinced that you belong to the Lord. That changes everything. Everything. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 tells us that our body is what? The temple of the Holy Spirit. That's why they didn't defile their bodies. Because they understood that they belonged to Yahweh. That's why we don't defile our bodies. Because we know that we belong to God. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You know, one of the main duties of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to make us holy. It's in his name. That's his main work. Holy means to set you apart from what? The world's ways, the world's wicked system, your own flesh. All right. And so we have to remember that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why we say no 
to the ways of the world, the ways of the flesh, the ways of the devil. And not only did Babylon want to indoctrinate and intoxicate these young godly men, they also wanted to strip them of their identity by changing their names. Again, go back to verse 7, Daniel 1, 7. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Now, Daniel's Hebrew name means God is my judge. Another way to say that is, not only can God tell me what to do, but I give an account to him. Every one of us gives an account to him. And they changed his name to a Babylonian name, and that was Balthazar, which means Bal protects the king. So instead of God is my judge or Elohim is my judge, Baal protects the king, the name of the main Babylonian God. So you can see there again, they, they're Babylonizing them. That's what they're doing. Hananiah's Hebrew name means the Lord is gracious. That's a beautiful name, right? Hananiah, the Lord is gracious. And they changed his name to Shadrach, which means command of Aku. Now, Aku was the name of another Babylonian god. So you had Baal, then you had Aku. And now Mishael's Hebrew name means who is like the Lord. That's another way to say no one compares to Yahweh. And they changed his name to Meshach, which means who is what Aku is. Right? Who is like Yahweh? They said, no, no, your name's going to be who is like Aku. Azariah's Hebrew name means the Lord is my helper. And they changed his name to Abednego, which means servant of Nego, that's another Babylonian god. So you had Baal, then you had Aku, and now you have Nego. Do you notice there that he changed his name to servant of Nego? So what was the whole point? It was to change their allegiance from serving Yahweh to serving Satan under the disguise of Nego, under the disguise of Baal or Aku. Really, it's, it's the serving of Satan through these false Babylonian gods. And so that was the main point. They wanted to strip God completely out of them. But I'll tell you one thing, they may have changed their names, but they sure didn't change their hearts. They sure didn't change their hearts. Even after all the indoctrination, they stood for holiness. They stood for purity. They stood for not being defiled to the glory of God. Their bodies were in Babylon, but their hearts were in Jerusalem. Your bodies are here in America, but your heart should be in heaven. You know what the Bible says? Seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Wherever your heart is, there is your treasure. Where is your heart? That is your treasure. Is it Christ? And in Daniel chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar makes a giant statue of himself covered in gold. You guys can read that later on for homework. It's a story of how Nebuchadnezzar had a dream of this giant statue. And it was really a representation of him and the kingdoms that go after him. And in this dream, a giant rock comes and just destroys that thing. And that's Revelation chapter 19, where Jesus comes on the white stallion, comes down after the seven year tribulation to destroy the Antichrist and his kingdom. So it's a picture of Jesus Christ. And so he erects this giant statue because he realizes that he's a mighty king. Not just a mighty king, but the mightiest king in all the world. And so he gets a little cocky and he says, you know, let's build a statue then. And it's about 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. We can say it's about eight times the size of this building going up. So it's pretty tall. And anyone who didn't bow to the statue was burned alive. Now let's see how the godly Hebrew boys handle this. Turn your Bibles to... Daniel chapter 3, we're going to read verses 8 to 30. 
So if you haven't been reading lately, you're going to catch up today. So I just wanted you guys to see that they were loyal in Babylon, as you already saw that. They were loyal to their king, the Lord, above the king, which was Nebuchadnezzar. And, and now you're going to see that they were also very brave, very courageous. All right, starting there in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psalm tree in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. That's the command. Whoever doesn't do this, as we'll see, will be burnt up. But I just want you guys to think for a moment how Satan can use music to manipulate us. Listen, you got to be very careful with what you listen to. Some people say, well, I just listen to the beat. That's a lie. <laughs> you know, or they're watching the videos. I just see the pretty colors. That's not true. Right. And so we got to be very careful because, look, there's a message in everything we listen to. And you have to understand that it's counseling you or advising you or pushing you to do something, to think something to dress a certain way, to carry yourself in a certain way, to have a kind of devilish attitude, to have a promiscuous personality. That's what the music is for. You listen to it and you bow. You listen to it and you bow. Your heart bows, your mind bows, your thoughts bow. Verse 11. <laughs> and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. All right? You don't bow, you burn. Twelve, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, wrong names. Uh, you know, they're real names. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. In other words, they don't respect you. They don't respect your command. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, that's an amazing testimony. Right off the bat, these men are telling the king, you know those four guys that you promoted? They do not serve your gods, and they will not worship the golden image you have set up. In other words, and they will not worship you. That should be your testimony. That should honestly and truly be your testimony. And I'm not saying that that should be a testimony today, this morning. I mean, that should be a testimony when you're in your car and nobody's watching what you listen to when you're at home in a dark room by yourself. I'm talking about not bowing to the enemy. Yeah. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, again, he's the most powerful man in the world at this time, in rage and fury gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Now, what have you know that this could have really been a sweaty palm type of situation or a, a biting of the nails or a knocking of the knees because you're coming before again the most powerful, the most vicious man in all the world. He would make Hitler look like a kindergarten bully. Verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, is it true? In his mind, he's, he thinks he's being merciful. He, he thinks he's giving them a chance to bow down before they burn. Is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready, in other words, I'm going to give you another chance. Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, or psalm tree in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good. That's his way of saying, I'm going to spare you. In other words, he's thinking this is the best thing you could do today. Don't you love your flesh? Do you want it to burn? Don't you love your life? Don't you love the positions? and the royalty, and the respect, and the honor I've given you in Babylon? Don't you enjoy all the goodies in Babylon? But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. 
And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Now this is faith. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, in other words, if we got to burn to death, like, like they'd rather burn to death than to bow to anyone but Yahweh. Think about that level of commitment. He says, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. In other words, do whatever you want to us. We are not bowing down. Verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was full of fury. And the expression on his face changed towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In other words, it's to say that when they first came to him, he didn't have an angry face on at first. You know, he might have had like a little smile, giving them an opportunity. But then they rejected him and his true colors came out. He spoke and commanded that they heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain mighty men of valor who were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their trousers, their turbans, and other garments and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Imagine that moment. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the fire burned the persecutors. You have to understand that at the end of it all, no matter how bad this world treats the church, those who persecute Christ and his church will burn in hell. This is a picture of that. Those who come against God, come against his ways, come against his people, harm his people, they will be burned. Verse 23 and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. And he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He says, Look. He answered, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not burnt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Well, that right there is called a Christophany. This is Jesus Christ in the fire with these men. And when he calls him the Son of God, he has no idea what he's really saying, but he's right about Jesus being the Son of God. But he just saw him as one of the sons of the gods. And the reason why he says the form of the fourth is like the son of God was, it could very well be that he was shining brighter than the fires itself. There was something about his form that looked divine. There was something about his presence that was different. He said, that's different. And so Jesus is in the fire with these three Hebrew boys. 23, then Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together, and they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. And just so you know, we're going to be given glorified bodies and how will have no power over our glorified bodies. But if you reject Christ, you're going to be given a body that can handle the flames of hell forever and it's not going to be good. The hair of their head was not singed, nor were their garments affected, and the smell of fire was not on them. Think about that. It's amazing. 28 is miraculous, really. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. 
And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any God except their own God. Are you yielding your bodies? I mean, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, present your bodies a living sacrifice. How are you yielding your body? How are you giving your eyes to God, your ears to God, your private parts to God? How are you glorifying God with what he's giving you? Verse 29, therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation or land, Language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. Man, the tables are turned now, right? He's giving the one true God glory at this point to some degree. And their houses shall be made an ha- ash sheep. In other words, going to be burnt up. Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Remember the names of one of the false gods? There is no one like Aku. Now he's realizing there's no one like Yahweh. There's no one like Elohim. 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Man, what what an amazing story. There's so much there. These four young Hebrew Jewish men stood for Yahweh no matter what. And some of you might be thinking, well, why wasn't Daniel thrown in the fire furnace? He obviously wasn't there. Uh, Because we already know that he was thrown in the lion's den later and nothing happened to him. So he would have been with them. If he was there present, we know that. Here is the irony, though. There were about 3,000 to 10,000 Jews that were taken from Jerusalem and into Babylon. All right. This was one of the biggest events that Babylon has ever put together. The worship of King Nebuchadnezzar through a golden image. You have about 10,000 Jews there present. And only three stood up. Think about that. Only three presented their bodies as a living sacrifice to the one true God. Where were the rest? Where were the rest? I'm sure there were other Jews there bowing down. And they hear that there are three that are still standing and they're trying to peek and see who's brave enough to stand against the laws of the king, who's brave enough to stand for the ways of Yahweh. And all they see is three. And yet there's thousands of Jews there. Thousands of them who were raised in the Old Testament law. Who heard of Yahweh, who heard of the promises of the coming Messiah. Who knew the names of the prophets who prayed the Shema on a regular basis. These were people who went to the temple regularly, sacrificed to Yahweh for their own sins and the sins of others. These were Jews who sang the Psalms, and now they're bowing before a false God. That's what the majority of Christians in America still do today. As we speak. The majority of so-called Christians are not living for the one true God. Do you see it? I get like that because I recognize who these thousands and thousands of Jews are utterly and totally disrespecting. I recognize his worth. I recognize that there is no one like him. And whatever he says, you better do. And not only that we better do it, but because they're good for us too. Because God is all good and all of his commands are commands of love. And yet he's worthy of all of our obedience for the rest of your life. And if you had a million lives, every single one of those lives should be lived to the glory and the honor and the obedience of this great God. If you had a trillion hearts, they should all bow before Christ. This is a picture again of Christians in America where very few truly stand for God, truly practice righteousness. Many quote-unquote Christian churches, pastors, ministry leaders are bowing down, as you guys know, to the woke culture, affirming what God calls an abomination. And if you pay close attention to the U.S. government, anytime you see a an edifice or a facility or building that belongs to the government. 
You're not allowed to have crosses up. You're not allowed to have symbols of other false religions up. But you'll find the gay flag, even in the White House. In 2020, 15, they lit it up like the rainbow, which means that this homosexual lifestyle and this agenda has now become the great God of America. The day's gonna come when all of us will be tried, when all of us will have to make a stand and you better make it now. The day's gonna come where you're gonna lose your job because of that. The day's gonna come when you're gonna lose your church because of that. And if the Lord tarries, the day's gonna come when you're gonna lose your life because of it. It's coming. And if you pay attention to the way the ball's rolling, it's coming pretty quickly. There's no holding this back. The judgment of God is here and we're going to feel it. The church is going to feel the persecution of it. And still many questionable Christians get drunk. They get high. They watch porn. They live in fornication. That is, they live with their boyfriend and girlfriend and pretend like they're married and have sex outside of marriage. And there are many other things that fornication is. They treat the church and the worship of God like it's an option. Nowadays, people who go to church faithfully go to church once a month. I don't call that faithful. I call that absolutely ridiculous. And people need to repent and put God's worship above their own life. There's so many people nowadays, don't you see it? I mean, there are many, many parents who have put uh, their child's sports above the worship of God. That's another God in America. Sports, kids' sports. Well, my kid's going to go to the pros. No, he's not. Bring him to church. He needs Christ. He needs Christ. Stop playing. And many still enjoy the world's worthless entertainment. And I'm talking about those things that are obviously evil, right? I'm not trying to take away all your fun. No, there's joy in Christ. But it's got to be pure. It's got to be honorable. It's got to be clean. It's got to be God honoring. And while never truly praying to God or seeking the face of God as though he were treasure, or never really reading the word of God. And, and yet they give their whole time to this world's entertainment. And they'll tell you left and right, we love God. We love God. We're disciples of Christ. Show me. <laughs> That'd be nice. Show me your love somehow. Show me some level of dedication, some level of commitment. Don't fool yourself. Don't fool yourself. The Bible says, don't be deceived. That those who call themselves Christians and live a worldly lifestyle as a way of life are not going to heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, it makes it very clear. Even if you feel the little warmsies when you come to church on Sunday. If you live in sin and you do not repent on a regular basis as a true born again believer of Christ, you are on your way to hell, my friend. Even if you sense and, and, and enjoy the presence of God to some degree. Many do. And they think that's salvation. You need to know that you have a brand new heart. You need to know for yourself that from the inside out, you are truly transformed. And you're being made into the likeness of Christ. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about connection. I'm talking about direction. So I don't want to put too much weight on you, but I want you to feel what I'm saying. This is the most important thing. Look, I tell my church over and over, I sound like a broken record. I tell my sons the same thing. The two most important things, be saved and know you're saved. Be saved and know you're saved. Getting that wrong will put you in hell forever. And rightfully so. Because you have sinned against a God who is thrice holy. You have sinned against a God that you will never even after a million years understand the level of holiness that he really is. And you'll never understand the level of wickedness that we really are. So when I say we deserve it, I mean it. But in his goodness, he sent his, his son to die on the cross for all of our sins. And for those of you who are born again and you're still playing with sin, just confess your sin, turn from your sin. There is sufficient grace. The Lord says that he will forgive you of all your sins and cleanse all your unrighteousness. But if you're one who's playing a Christian, but you just know that in that chest of yours, there really hasn't been a true change of life. There hasn't been a transition of God's, you or something else, and the one true God. Then you are in serious and grave danger. You need to come to Jesus today, like right now. Well, I said a lot, and I pray that something I said really moved you guys. 
Some of you guys might be trembling in fear. And I hope you do because fear is the beginning of wisdom. Listen, God doesn't save anyone he doesn't offend first. God doesn't save anyone he doesn't offend first. That's why many people in churches like Joel Olstein's church and many others, people are not truly repenting, turning away from sin. Why? Because there is no fear of God. They're being told that they're already okay with God, but they're not. They're on their way to hell. So if you feel a sense of fear, praise God. Even as a born-again believer, why? Because that tells me that you're going to get things right with God. And not because he's some tyrannical being in heaven, but because he deserves all of your devotion and much more than you could ever give him. He deserves all of your love. He deserves all of your songs. He deserves all of your time with that book open in front of you. He deserves all of your prayers. He deserves everything. I mean, we fall woefully short, seriously. Our worship is so tiny, it's laughable in comparison to the greatness of who he is. So do something about it. Give him everything, amen? Give God praise for his word today.